We've brought in a special guest to North Dakota, Steve Groth of Cover Crop Coaching. And Steve, you're a farmer and you've also traveled the world talking about cover crops with, with farmers everywhere. Yeah, it's something that has been really fascinating for me because what I've learned in my farm in Pennsylvania, what I see around the U.S. and around the world is there's a lot of similarities in the whole um, movement, if you will, of soil health and cover crops. Now, there's also a lot of differences. And that's why we have meetings to get together like this to try to figure out how to apply those basic principles that we know that are worldwide, but to apply them in a local area. So what is your main message when it comes to those basic principles on, on getting farmers started with cover crops or using them effectively? Yeah, I keep it pretty simple. I just uh, try to encourage farmers wherever they're at to use a little less tillage and a few more cover crops. Uh, so you can get even more complicated than that, but that's really what we're talking about. But it's all underlaid with trying to increase your diversity. Diversity of species, which can involve both your cash crops and your cover crops. So if you do those things, you're well on the way to be, being able to experience some of the soil health benefits that people are experiencing worldwide. And so when you go through this, this progression with farmers and coaching them how to do this, does a lot of it reflect on how you transitioned into using no-till and cover crops on yeah. your farm? Yeah. Well, everybody has their story. I share my story. I hear your story. I hear everyone's stories. You take from that what you can learn. One thing that I've found has been very effective is for farmers to identify a mentor or someone that they can uh, kind of learn from. And I encourage people to think about that in the context of who is doing what I want to do and then try to connect with those people. Uh, that has been very effective and it's, gonna, it's, gonna, it's, it's not going to waste time. I, I tell people what, what took me 20 years to get to this point, you can do in five or less with your soil, with what we know now. So I think that's what's exciting with this movement. Uh, is we know it works. How you apply it to each farm is, is kind of the the challenge we have before us. And so on your farm, you worked a lot with tillage radish and also with the University of Maryland with, with Ray Weil that we had on the Soil Health Minute this right. year. And yeah. um, so what has that experience been like for you? It's been life changing. I started working with Ray Weil in the mid 90s, uh, doing some long term cover crop research. We had plots for 12 continuous years where we monitored the, uh, the cash crop response with and without cover crops. And it was the fourth year into that where we had a drought in our area. And I had 28 bushels more of corn where the cover crops had been planted. And I haven't asked the question, do cover crops pay ever since that? Because I saw how they worked on my farm. And then in 2001, uh, Dr. Weil bought, brought a radish to my farm. And I saw that opportunity. I was impressed with it. We got yield increases. And so uh, took that, branded it, silly radish, started a seed company with it. And as they say, sometimes the rest is history. So is radish really, is that one of your go-to species that you would use on your farm? And, and where you'd help farmers start would be with a radish or what kind of small grain might you put in there or grass? Well, one of the reasons the tilly radish became popular so quickly is because it worked. You could see a difference in your soil. Um, and uh, some people have said it was kind of the gateway drug to cover crops. I think it really created a buzz uh, that created an awareness for cover crops nationwide, or worldwide for that matter. The time was right, and it helped raise the awareness of all cover crops. So yes, cover crop, or excuse me, tillage radish is a, a, a component of, of pretty much all my cover crop mixes, but now, instead of being like the driving force, it's like the salt and pepper. Mm -hmm. It's just sprinkled in the mix. So I'm gonna have radishes there on my farm, in any time during that planting window that we can have it. But it's not so much the main cover crop anymore. And you have, so I, I like when you talked about how you include your cash crops as part of your diversity and, your, and you include the cover crops from there. So, so you started maybe, I think on your slide, I saw that in your presentation you had seven, seven species that yes. you were including. So your cash crops plus mm -hmm. just one cover crop in that. Yep. What was that cover crop? Well, that's back in 1982 when I started no-till. Uh, the cover crop then was cereal rye, which ironically to this day is one of the most popular cover crops out there because it's so versatile. But now I've expanded both my cash crops and my cover crops. I mean, I listed 27 different species 
And when you're thinking diversity, the soil doesn't know the difference between a cash crop and a cover crop. Uh, basically, the biology within the soil is going to respond to diversity. So when, if you can expand that, and I like to challenge farmers that you got to think a little bit beyond corn and soybeans if you want some of these results that we're talking about. You're just going to have to. Um, so wherever you're at, can you start with a small grain maybe? which opens you up then to a multi-species cover crop. So that's just a, a freebie there of how to get, in, get in, into this. And then what do you think, or some of you mentioned these, these benefits. What are some of the benefits that you're seeing on your farm, but then also across the world that people are getting out of using cover crops and, and no-till? Well, for me, because I come from a hillier section of Pennsylvania, uh, winter erosion control from water erosion, uh, keeping the soil covered, cover crops. You know, that was kind of where it was at. I had no idea even about legumes that could actually produce nitrogen, that could effectively reduce my off-farm purchases. I didn't know this stuff back in the early 80s when I started this. Uh, I didn't know that cover crops can, uh, you know, help loosen up the soil and all that. Didn't know anything. Uh, now they do so many different things. and. One of the things that is key for people in their success is to identify what is the goal you're trying to accomplish with cover crops. It could be multiple things. Uh, weed control. Now with these herbicide resistant weeds, cover crops can address that. Uh, you have to be very intentional about it, but they can help. So there's probably a hundred different things that cover crops can do. What do you want to do on your farm? And you need to identify what those objectives are and then strive to meet them. It's going to be the secret to making something happen. Yeah, it's a really complex system. I, I feel like you said complexity a lot in your presentation today. Yes. And, and it's, it's so difficult to manage all those things. But your, one of your tips was to manage a cover crop like a cash crop. Right. And that seems pretty critical yeah. and effective use. If you hear Steve Groff speak, in his slide presentation will be a slide that says, treat your cover crops like your cash crops. I've had that slide for 10 years or more. Don't plan on taking it out anytime soon because it's so effective in the mindset of a farmer because you have to have that mindset in order to be successful that you treat the cover crops the same way you treat your cash crops. Uh, plant them on time. Use the right species. Have the right planting equipment. Same things you think through your mind for growing your cash crops. You have to do with your cover crops if you're gonna be successful. Yeah, one of the things when you talk about planting on time and you have this video in there where you're, you're, you're videotaping the combine, yeah. but then you turn around and you see that you're actually seeding cover crops 30 yeah. seconds behind the combine. And 30 or 40. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> give or take a few. <laughs> and that's so critical. I mean, and, and you're in Pennsylvania where you have, I think, a bigger window than we do here in North Dakota. And in North Dakota, we, we, if, if we're six days behind on cover crop seeding, your, your biomass is, is half as much as it could be. And so that seems a pretty critical point. And so Steve, you've talked a lot about where we've come from yeah. in our use of cover crops, but where are we going in the future? I really see a game changer on the horizon. Uh, and it's primarily because I, I feel like I have a front row seat. I'm a vegetable farmer. And some of the markets that I'm selling to, like Whole Foods or Blue Apron, they're asking me, how many cover crops do I have in my rotation? What percentage of the year are living roots in my soil? And I actually was amazed when I saw these questions coming through. And they have actually come to my farm and toured my farm, looked at my farm during the growing season, not so much to check up on a regulatory uh, standpoint, but just to observe how I'm growing, because then they can tell their consumers, their end users, we have this produce grown in an environmentally sensitive way. The cover crop story is easy to tell, and, and everybody can understand it very quickly. So now I'm starting to see even corn soybean buyers are starting to ask the same questions. And I, what I see coming down the road is there'll have to be some sort of component in the way you grow, whatever you grow, that will have to have a soil health aspect to it. I'm not sure when it will actually take in effect, I see it coming. So I think when farmers have this before them, I see it as an opportunity. I am hoping that it's an incentivization, that they'll say we'll give you a few extra 
you know, a little extra money for doing this. That's what I hope it's, it's going to be. Farmers will figure it out pretty quick if they're incentivized to do it. So uh, that's where I see the future going in cover crops and soil health. So we might as well start using them now because you never know when it's going to pay out in the future. Start small. Start small. And learn from there. Well, thank you so much for You're being welcome. here and for your time. Pleasure. Yeah. Well, I'm, I really appreciate having you here in North Dakota. It's been a wonderful experience, mm -hmm. and you've got a closing keynote, yeah. too, about where do we go from here, and, yes. and that seems to be the next step that everybody yeah. can leave and, yeah. and have a good idea of what they're going to do. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about that. I'd like to share some things that I see on the horizon that I think will motivate farmers to plant cover crops that they're not even aware of. So I'm really looking forward to sharing what that is. Can I get a sneak peek of that now before? No. Um, <laughs> It has to do with the market, meaning the buyers, the, the, the people, the companies that farmers sell to, where they sell their products. We're starting to see a pretty significant groundswell of interest in growing your products in such a way that has some sort of component with soil health in it. It includes cover crops, less tillage. Uh, so I'm gonna share it with you personal experience. I happen to be a vegetable farmer, so I sell food for human consumption, and they are asking me, how many cover crops do I grow? What is my rotation? They're asking me these very questions, and right now, it's giving me a competitive adva advantage, because I can get in stores that other farmers can't. I see that going to be trickling down in the future, so I'm going to share about that.